Hi everyone, Nima Romani, real lawyer, former federal prosecutor, practicing for 20 years, reacting to The Lincoln Lawyer, season two, part one. So that is my client's house, 18001 Remington Place, and that is the house where he was arrested, 18010. As you can see, they're almost identical, even the numbers. So? So burglary requires a specific intent to commit a crime. I, this was just a mistake. My, my client was under the influence. He thought it was his house, his kid didn't work, so he broke what he thought was his own window. So much going on here. What we're seeing is a plea negotiation between the defense and the prosecution. The defense wants to get a felony burglary charge reduced down to a misdemeanor trespass, which is a far less serious crime. And the issue here is intoxication and intent. So burglary is unique in that it's a specific intent crime. That means that you have to intend to commit the act, not just doing it knowingly. So in this particular case, the defense is arguing that the defendant intended to go into his own house. So he didn't have the necessary intent, the mens rea, which is Latin for the guilty mind. And without that, he's not going to be guilty. So he's presenting a defense that he's going to argue at trial if the case doesn't resolve. And is really focused on intoxication. So there's two types of intoxication. There's a voluntary intoxication and there's involuntary intoxication. Voluntary intoxication is what you think it is, getting drunk. And normally getting drunk voluntarily is not a defense to the crime. However, it can negate the intent for a specific intent of crime. And whether it's burglary or other specific intent crimes include first degree murder, for instance, intending to kill someone, not just murdering someone. So the voluntary intoxication could be a defense to the burglary, but then he brings up the rohypnol, the date rape drug. Involuntary intoxication is a defense to almost all crimes, except strict liability crimes. So the defense is saying, hey, if my client was roofied, that's a pure defense. And not only is it a pure defense that's gonna get him acquitted, it's gonna be a bad look for the district attorney because the public will know at a public trial that there's people being roofied at bars. So for that reason, because of the specific intent, because of the voluntary and involuntary intoxication and the bad press, the district attorney decides to reduce the felony down to a misdemeanor. Your Honor, the people charge Lisa Marie Trammell under Penal Code 187A with the first degree murder unlawfully and with malice aforethought of Mitchell Bondurant. The people further charge that said murder was committed with the special circumstance of lying in wait. How does the defendant plead? Not guilty, Your Honor. Look at that, like clockwork. Anything else before I call a recess so the press can skedaddle and peace can return to my house? Your Honor, we like to schedule a prelim setting for tomorrow and to make a motion for bail. This is a special circumstance murder, Your Honor. Per the schedule, there is no bail. And the people would strenuously object to any deviation from that. Ms. Trammell is a danger to the community and a potential flight risk. Ms. Trammell owns a restaurant with over 30 employees who depend on her, Your Honor. Far from being a danger to her community, she's the heart and soul of it, has no intentions of fleeing. I mean, look at all the people here to support her. That will not fly in my courtroom. One more sound and I clear the room. Judge, the defense would like to paint his client as some sort of folk hero, but that doesn't change the fact that the victim filed a temporary restraining order against her. This is a dangerous individual. I've heard enough. We're splitting the difference. Bail will be set at $2 million. We'll reconvene here tomorrow to schedule a preliminary hearing. Unless, of course, we can make this go away. Maybe with a plea. There is a presumption in the United States that trials are open to the public. And in state court in California, that means that trials can be televised or reporters can attend in person. In federal court, reporters can attend, but cameras aren't allowed. So the judge might not like the press and media being there, but there's nothing she can do about it except complain. Next, we're talking about the charge itself, which is Penal Code 187, which is murder. But it's not just murder, it's first degree murder. That's the most serious type of murder, and that's something that's done intentionally and willfully. And there's usually a special circumstance that's charged 
if the prosecution wants to seek the death penalty. California has another death penalty in a while, but that's why those special circumstances exist. And the one that's alleged here is lying in wait. That means essentially waiting for your victim and intending to kill them. The big issue that was talked about though is bail. And when judges are considering bail, they look at two factors, risk of flight and danger to the community. Now in murder cases, there's a presumption of no bail. That's why the prosecution says there's not even bail listed on the schedule. That's just the default bail amount that judges sometimes will look to when deciding whether to set bail or not. So the question is, is the defendant at risk of flight? Is she a danger to the community? And is this someone that's gonna appear at future court proceedings? The prosecution argues that the victim had a restraining order. This is a first degree murder case, which means that this defendant intended to kill the victim. It's not something that just happened. So the defense does a good job under the circumstances of arguing that this is someone with ties to the community. They have a lot of support and that's why bail is appropriate. I was surprised the judge set bail at 2 million, but likely this defendant has little to no criminal history. Usually there'd be a much more extensive bail hearing than this. And this is a judge that clearly wants nothing to do with the case. She is saying, hey, is a plea agreement possible? Is there a way that this case can go away? First at her home, then at the station. She came willingly. Detective, when did you decide to place Lisa Trammell under arrest? During questioning, the defendant made contradictory statements about whether or not she'd seen Mr. Bondurant the morning he was murdered. She also made statements that seemed to bolster her motive for murder. At that point, we detained her and procured a warrant to search her premises. Thank you, detective. Nothing further. Mr. Holler, any questions? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Detective Long. You testified about statements made by another potential witness, Marco Schaefer, an employee of the victim? That's correct. So I assume you were present during Ms. Schaefer's interview? Well, no, actually, my partner, Detective O'Brien, conducted it. I was canvassing for witnesses. I see. So you didn't personally observe Marco Schaefer making these statements? I observed the video recording when I returned. You observed the video recording. Your Honor, under the penal code, a peace officer can testify at a preliminary hearing to one level of hearsay only. This is two. The witness who placed my client at the crime scene gave her statement to Detective O'Brien, not Detective Long. Therefore, Detective O'Brien needs to be here to testify. Mr. Aller has a point, Ms. Freeman. Can you produce Detective O'Brien? Unfortunately, Judge, he is on medical leave and unable to appear until trial. In that case, Your Honor, the defense moves to strike this entire line of testimony. It's hearsay and cannot be considered in this hearing. I can but... have Ms. Schaefer on the stand tomorrow morning, Judge. She can testify to what she saw personally. That work for you, Mr. Holler? That would be fine, Your Honor. Very well. In that case, I am granting the motion to strike. We will continue this hearing tomorrow morning in order to hear from Ms. Schaefer directly. The witness is excused. So what we're seeing here is a preliminary hearing and the rules of evidence that apply to a preliminary hearing are prelim. Before a defendant has to go to trial in a felony case, this doesn't apply to misdemeanors, one of two things needs to happen. He or she needs to either go to a prelim or be indicted by a grand jury. A grand jury is a secret proceeding. There's a group of jurors that hear the evidence. There's no defendant or no defense attorney. It's just the prosecutor. He or she presents the case and the grand jurors decide whether there's enough probable cause to move forward. And it just requires a majority of the grand jurors. And because they don't hear the defense side of the case, they usually indict or return a true bill. The other way is what we're seeing, which is a prelim, which is a mini trial uh, without most of the rules of evidence before a judge. And a judge decides, is there enough probable cause to move forward to an actual jury trial? And probable cause is a relatively low standard. It's much lower than beyond a reasonable doubt, which is what you need to convict in a criminal case, or even preponderance of the evidence, is, which is 50.1%, what you need to prove liability in a civil case. But it gives the defense an opportunity to hear from some of the prosecution witnesses and get some free discovery. So even though the rules of evidence don't fully apply in a prelim, such as hearsay, there are some exceptions. And this is under Proposition 213, which was passed by California voters many decades ago. But what it essentially says is this, an officer can testify to hearsay. Hearsay is an out of court statement. So here you see the witness, an officer testifying about a witness said, but because the officer didn't 
herself interview the witness. It's actually double hearsay. The witness herself would be able to testify. The officer who interviewed the witness would be the one testifying to hearsay. But a third, a second officer watching what the first officer did would be double hearsay, and that's not allowed at a preliminary hearing. So that's why the DA needs to actually bring the witness to testify at the prelim because the officer who conducted the interview is on leave and not available. There's a full parking lane in order to see anyone on the sidewalk. Maybe, but I saw her. She was there. Right. Your Honor, the defense would like to introduce three photographs and mark them as Exhibit A. These photos were taken on this very block at exactly 9.05 this morning. Objection. We've received no photographs. I apologize to court and counsel. That's because they were just taken and sent to me. And they're on my phone, but I'm happy to text or email them to Ms. Freeman if you'd like, or you can, uh... Your Honor, there's no foundation for any of these pictures. Well, the person who took them is a law student at a criminal practice clinic at my firm. Your Honor, she can be on the stand this afternoon to verify them, and Ms. Schaefer herself can verify the location. May I see the photos? Your Honor. I'll allow the pictures pending testimony on verification. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Schaefer, these photos were taken at exactly the spot indicated on the diagram, from the driver's seat of my employee's Mini Cooper. Do you drive a Toyota Corolla, do you not? Yes. Yeah, about the same size as a Mini Cooper, would you agree? I guess so. Good. So then looking at this picture, how clearly can you see the pedestrians on the sidewalk? OK. Not very clearly. And now? I guess the same. How about now? Can you see past both lanes of cars in any of these photos? I was inching forward, trying to get to the intersection to turn right. Wait, I'm confused now. Were you looking at the sidewalk to your right or at the road in front of you to make a turn? I... Both. Look, I know what I saw. Did you think much of it in the moment? What? In the moment. Did you think to yourself, oh, there goes Lisa Trammell. What's she doing here? Or was it only after you got to work and you heard about what happened to your boss? Maybe you even saw that photo of my client behind the desk? Was that when you started to think about who you thought you saw walking down the sidewalk? So we're continuing with the prelim and this is the key eyewitness who's testifying. So the first is the issue regarding the photographs. And before any photograph is admitted into evidence, a foundation has to be laid. And that's pretty simple. All the witness needs to do is to say that the photographs are a true and accurate depiction of whatever they're showing. So it can be a witness on the stand, it can be another witness, but that's how you authenticate or lay the foundation for pictures that are taken. So once that's done, it's really a question of what did this witness see? And here's some pretty effective cross-examination where you see the defense lawyer getting the witness to say, well, maybe I didn't see that clearly that day. And then there's an inconsistency where the witness says, well, I wasn't necessarily looking, I was actually driving and making a turn. So this is a pretty effective way of impeaching or cross-examining a witness to show that maybe what they saw or their recollection isn't as accurate as what they said during direct examination. Ms. Gates, how long have you been on the job? 16 years, 17 in June. And in that time, how many crimes have you analyzed evidence from? I've been the primary analyst in well over a thousand cases. People's two, Your Honor, this is a copy of Ms. Gates' report from this case. Now, Ms. Gates, did you analyze a pair of gardening gloves taken from the defendant's shed and booked into evidence under DR number 1113-0907? Yes, I did. And this photo at the back of your report, is this a photograph of the gloves in question? That's right. Objection, Your Honor. None of this was provided in discovery. That's because I was just presented with this report today, Your Honor, and I was not initially intending to use it at this hearing. Approach, Your Honor. The prosecution has an obligation to produce, broadly speaking, 
three categories of discovery. The first is anything that's required by statute or the penal code or the rules of criminal procedure. And this will include any witness statements, the defendant statements, expert witness reports like we're seeing here. And then there's two categories that are required by the Constitution. Any exculpatory evidence, any evidence that tends to show the defendant's not guilty, or any evidence that tends to impeach or call into question a witness's credibility. So this is something that should have been produced as soon as it was received under that first category. That now that the evidence did come in and the witness is testifying though, the question becomes, you know, now you have the defendant and the victim's DNA on the defendant's gloves. And that's gonna be enough evidence to satisfy that probable cause standard. Remember we talked about that earlier, it's a low standard. Doesn't mean that the defendant's actually guilty, but is there just enough probable cause to proceed? And based on this expert's testimony, the judge found that there was. Thanks for watching everyone. Make sure to stay tuned for part two of season two, where we actually get to the trial in the case and make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.